Thank you, and good morning. Thank you for the invitation uh, from Systems. This is actually my first time at the annual meeting, and it's been uh, a very pleasurable and interesting first, uh, first two days. Uh, this is work I've been doing at, at CUNY in New York. We have a new uh, science research center, um, the Advanced Science Research Center, and environmental science is one of our uh, five new research areas. Um, we have colleagues at City College, and James and Effie, um, who are obviously uh, here, and Effie had to leave last night. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about relative sea level rise, and which we've heard some about so far in this meeting, uh, but also connecting it into the outcomes for the communities and the people who live in these systems. Um, I'm trying to ask, at the global scale, can we see different patterns and separate out different drivers from uh, the uh, from each other and see are different systems more sensitive to uh, particular environmental changes. So this won't come as a surprise to anybody in this room. Um, the relative sea level rise is one of the major challenges facing deltas. Um, if we look at the global mean sea level rise, it's substantially lower than the total relative sea level rise being experienced in many delta systems. Um, and, the, and this 1.8 is actually quite out of date. Uh, more recent estimates closer to 3 millimeters per year. And with even more recent estimates of changes in uh, sea ice melt rates, uh, this number is probably needing to soon be revised up. Uh, and then when we talk about people who live in these systems, substantial areas of these deltas are below sea level. And this is, I wouldn't call this sustainable, but people can live here and aren't swimming every day because uh, there are protected levees and there are coastal infrastructure uh, in place to uh, maintain the livability of these areas uh, for the time being. So we're going to start asking, uh, how sustainable is this? And can we draw any conclusions about what different future scenarios might hold for these systems? So a lot of this work has been inspired by a paper from 2006 um, from Erickson et al. Uh, and they looked at a, a suite of deltas across the globe and tried to divide up the major driving factors of relative sea level rise in these different systems. And we can kind of divide these up into three different boxes. We have uh, sediment trapping or, or upstream influences, so do dams and reservoirs trap sediment to reduce sediment fluxes to the deltas. Uh, what's going on in the delta itself? So here accelerated subsidence refers to uh, uh, pumping of groundwater out of the sediments, uh, extraction of hydrocarbon, uh, and then there's offshore factors, uh, particularly uh, sea level rise. So the consequences of a given amount of sea level rise for a particular delta, though, is not going to be the same uh, everywhere. So we can imagine two different uh, scenarios. If you are in this delta with very shallow relief and a lot of development and population very close to the shore, uh, I would say, I think, this is a riskier place to live than a delta that is more like the one on the right. So to first order, I would prefer to live here. It's probably less risky. We can also talk about the hazards that different systems are exposed to. Uh, these are storm tracks, and so the Mississippi is exposed to a different suite of hazardous events than, say, the Amazon. So it's another way we can consider the importance of relative sea level rise in terms of changing the risk outcome for the communities living here. And then we can also consider that different systems are able to protect themselves proactively or reactively. Um, in the event of a hazardous event, some communities are able to respond better, better infrastructure, more hospitals. Um, so we have the, the Ganges, which has lots of earth and levees and holders, and then in the Netherlands, um, billions and billions of dollars of, of engineered infrastructure uh, that is preventing flooding um, on a regular basis. 
So the communities living on these systems experience the effects of relative sea level rise very differently. Uh, in our work, we're taking a suite of 48 deltas uh, across the globe and trying to make heuristic estimates of both relative sea level rise and how that is changing the risk in these systems. Um, one of the constraints working at the global scale uh, for comparative purposes is we're limited to global scale data sets. So for the most part we're using uh, remote sensing, global numerical modeling, um, some global data sets that are derived from administrative social data such as uh, population, um, GDP. Uh, and I'm also going to talk a bit about the distinction between risk and vulnerability. Those two terms are somewhat overloaded. Um, and even within the community, they're, they're often used for different purposes. So I'll get to that in just one second. Um, but these systems, when we consider the social aspects and the, the vulnerability of the communities here, uh, can get very complicated very quickly. So uh, it's hard to see, but we have multiple spatial scales here from uh, the upstream basin, the delta, and then local sub-delta regions. We have multiple hazards that they're exposed to, so uh, natural and climactic hazards and anthropogenic hazards even. Um, and then the impacts are across various social system scales, uh, ranging from uh, provinces up to the national level and international levels. Um, and all of these terms and factors come together to kind of set the stage for, for risk, which I'll define all these terms more in just one moment. Um, and so in the literature, there's a, a large number of indicators that have been used for assessing the vulnerability of a particular community to a hazardous event. So how, how impactful is a particular hazardous event, and in what ways might this vary between different communities? Uh, and if you squint, you can see we're looking at urbanization, population density, uh, infrastructure and economic variables like water supply, uh, transportation. And then demographics of the community, are people wealthy, uh, what is the age distribution, um, how sensitive are people's income streams and their livelihoods to uh, climate relevant or climate sensitive uh, industries. And then uh, food and waterborne diseases, there's a whole suite of indicators that have been used. At the global scale, we're somewhat restricted because we don't have much of this data at the global scale. Uh, so we're going to be using a, a smaller subset of this to try to get in a comparative sense across these systems. So when we talk about risk, we're modeling risk as an expected loss. So if we consider one particular hazardous event, we can say that the, the expected loss from that hazardous event is the product of the exposure. So how many people are exposed to hazardous events from that, uh, hazardous conditions by that event? And then the vulnerability. So if you are exposed, how much loss do you experience? Are you, do you, uh, is your home damaged? Are you injured? Are people killed or displaced? Um, and that can, that's going to vary dramatically across different systems and different events. So because these terms are often used in different ways, I like to think of uh, the hazardous event term as these storm tracks. So how, how likely is a storm to affect you? Exposure is where do you live? So if there is if there's a two meter storm surge, do you live half a meter above sea level right on the coast, or do you live five meters above sea level farther inland? So this would be population distributions and the number of people affected by an event. And then finally, vulnerability. I think of the three little pigs, right? They all have it's the same wolf blowing on all of those houses, but the stone, the, the brick house, is much more resilient. And, and does not experience the same loss as the poor pig in the straw house. So this would be the vulnerability term. And then we're not just concerned about one particular hazard event, but we're concerned about all potential hazard events. And so this has a probability distribution. And if we take this probability distribution and we sum over all events, we can get this estimate of risk. So the question becomes, what do these functions look like? What is the probability distri distribution across all hazardous events, not just storm surge, but also uh, fluvial flooding and, and any other event you could think of?
What is the exposure? So as we go to higher, larger events or more dangerous events, presumably more people would be exposed. Uh, these two terms can be estimated empirically, right? We can look at the historical record and say, well, this many storms hit this particular location, and when a storm of, of this size hit, you know, X number of people were exposed. So we can try to start estimating these functions. Uh, the vulnerability function is kind of more difficult. So different types of events are going to have very distinct um, effects on, on the communities. Uh, if you are exposed to a large flood, so if it's a two meter storm surge and you live at half a meter elevation and you're, you're flooded versus you're living at half a meter elevation and it's a one meter storm surge, well, you're flooded both times. So is, are you going to be damaged and harmed more in one event? It's somewhat unclear. So these terms can be estimated. Um, we're often limited by empirical data. So some deltas, we have lots of a very long historical record of, of impacts and other systems we, we don't. So if we're working at the global scale, we're getting uh, a very simplistic view by just coming up with a representative value for each of these terms. So each delta, we're saying, is it in a highly hazardous area or not? Is it, are the people there likely to be exposed? Are there a lot of people living close to the shoreline or not? And is the community more or less vulnerable than relative to another delta? Uh, so how are we estimating these, these terms? We're using an indicator-based approach. So uh, for hazard, we're looking at tropical cyclone intensity and frequency. Uh, we're looking at tidal amplitude, river discharge, uh, and extreme wave energy. So for each of these deltas, we are using global models and global uh, data sets to extract these terms. And then we're constructing an index from these indicators um, by normalizing each of them across all of the different delta systems. So this is a, a heuristic model. We're not modeling each of these individual processes. Um, but by putting them all together, we hope we can come up with a reasonable estimate of which delta systems are exposed to more hazardous conditions in a, um, kind of a hot spot type argument. So the vulnerability we saw before, many, many variables have been used. Uh, we are using two GDP-based indicators and uh, a government effectiveness indicator. So we can think of per capita GDP as uh, if people individually are wealthy, they can build homes out of brick instead of homes out of straw, uh, so they can protect themselves. If the delta as a whole is wealthy, it can construct large-scale infrastructure um, in the vein of uh, the Netherlands or uh, the Mississippi, uh, the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan. And then the question is, well, even if you have GDP and if you have some wealth, are you able to effectively utilize that for uh, risk reduction? And so that we're looking at a, a government effectiveness index. So how, how capable and how willing would a community be to invest in these uh, large-scale infrastructure projects? Uh, exposure, uh, we're actually interested in how relative sea level rise is impacting the change in risk. So we're skipping over exposure in it directly, and we're instead looking at the change in exposure associated with relative sea level rise. So relative sea level rise effectively lowers your uh, elevation above sea level. So everywhere within a delta that is experiencing relative sea level rise, we can say exposure is is increasing. It's, not, it's certainly not going to decrease anywhere. And we're uh, constructing this heuristic estimate of uh, relative sea level rise with these delta indicators, some upstream basin indicators, uh, population density, probably surface area, the proxies for development, uh, groundwater depletion, and hydrocarbon extraction. Wetland disconnectivity is a measure of the a disconnection between the river network and the floodplain. Um, we extract that from data sets of uh, locations of wetlands and locations of agricultural land. And then we also include a sea level rise offshore. Um, and it's not a perfect relationship, but it, it's reasonable when we compare it to estimates from, from the literature. So what do these indices end up looking like? 
Well, if we uh, stack up all of these different indicators, we see uh, and, and construct what we're calling an anthropogenic conditioning index. So this is how the human communities on the deltas and in the upstream basins are changing the natural environment of, uh, of the delta. Uh, we see on the left, we have uh, the, the Ganges on the far left. And just to highlight a few, the, the Mekong is somewhere in the middle, the Amazon is on the right, and if you squint, these are several high latitude deltas, the Yukon, the, the Mackenzie, and the Lena. The hazard index, um, the same deltas uh, are rearranged. These are very, very different terms, and they're not, uh, they're not correlated with the, the anthropogenic conditioning index at all. And the investment capacity, this is an inverse of vulnerability. So low, vulner low vulnerability, the Rhine, the Mississippi, uh, the South Friar, they're able, they have the GDP and the governments to presumably uh, protect themselves from hazardous events. Uh, whereas on the, the far side, we have the, the Irrawaddy, uh, the Limpopo, the Tana. Uh, no, we're just looking at these um, at the surface, yes. So if we put these different terms together, uh, according to that, uh, the, the risk model, expected loss is exposure times uh, vulnerability times hazard. We can estimate this rate of change of risk associated with relative sea level rise. So relative sea level rise is different amongst all these deltas, and that is proxied by this horizontal axis. Vertically is how exposed they are to hazard events. And the size of the dot here is the, the vulnerability. So larger dots here are more vulnerable. Uh, so this quadrant two is going to be the deltas that are experiencing large amounts of environmental change, are exposed to frequent or large hazardous events, and have the least capacity. And the large dots there are the ones with the least capacity to uh, respond to those proactively or reactively. Uh, so several, uh, to highlight a few, are the Ganges, which ends up quite high at the list. Uh, and as you know, these are per capita estimates. If we looked at populations at risk, um, the Ganges would be, quite, would be by far the highest. It has more than twice the population of the, the next nearest, which would be the, the Nile down in the mid-ranges. Uh, the Mekong, which we looked at before, and the Amazon. So they're scattered about this different uh, risk space. One thing to note is that several of these deltas that are either in or near quadrant two, so systems that we would expect based on uh, their environmental characteristics and their uh, exposure to hazardous events, we would expect these to be quite risky. Uh, but solely because they have very, very low vulnerability, uh, they end up in the bottom of the list. They're less sensitive to changes in relative sea level rise because they're able to actively defend against it, which is very good for them. Um, and it's, it's certainly uh, valuable right now that they can do that. There are people who live there and are benefiting every day because of the infrastructure that they're able to, uh, to protect, uh, to, to construct. So, because these systems are so dependent on low vulnerability, we're thinking, well, what, how, how sustainable is that? They're investing lots and lots of money to maintain these, these structures. And is that uh, sustainable in the, in the long run? So if we look at uh, energy price forecasts, which are uh, at the global scale, we think we can make some reasonable estimates of uh, in, in the short to medium term. And energy prices are expected to rise faster than GDP. Um, and if the global community gets more serious about um, limiting fossil fuel use, I think it's reasonable in the short term that, that this is, uh, could even be underestimating 
based on the economics of uh, the energy system. So if energy prices are rising faster than the available funds to buy that, to, to construct infrastructure and support and maintain that intra infrastructure, uh, we would expect that maintaining a certain level of economic, uh, a certain level of reduced vulnerability is going to become increasingly uh, expensive. So I would say that this is the very definition of not sustainable. Is it becoming more expensive to maintain the same amount of uh, infrastructure or for the same amount of money you get less bang for your buck? Um, we can reweight our vulnerability index to consider how this might affect the uh, long-term risk outcomes. I'm going to skip this guy. So on the left, we have this, this rate of change of risk if we're only considering the geophysical context. Uh, this is the environmental change and the, um, the, the hazardous events. And we can see the Ganges, the Yanks, and the, the Mississippi are near the top. When we also consider reduced vulnerability, uh, these wealthy deltas plummet. They're, they have greatly reduced risk outcomes. But if we imagine this future where energy prices are more expensive and the infrastructure that they're currently investing in um, becomes less effective, those particular deltas rebound into a, a higher risk state. And relative sea level rise becomes increasingly more important in those deltas as it is elsewhere. So a contemporary map of sensitivity to relative sea level rise in terms of uh, risk highlights South Asia, uh, where there's a lot of environmental change and less infrastructure to defend against uh, these hazards. But the deltas that are likely to be most impacted by uh, potentially fossil fuel constrained future are predominantly in uh, the Mississippi, in Europe, and in, in yeah, East Asia. So we're considering how to extend this to additional future scenarios beyond just the economic vulnerability argument. Um, part of the challenge is that we're not including any direct physical modeling, so we're starting to incorporate that. Uh, I have a number of plots that I'm going to skip right on over. So here we're starting with a number of geophysical and uh, uh, GIS type inputs, uh, reservoirs. We're using a sediment flux model and a relative sea level rise model and kind of coupling in a very loose, term, loose sense uh, to a coastal risk model to try to look at differences in populations at risk currently and in the future across all of these delta systems. Uh, so just as a, these, these two different colors or two different potential scenarios, these are very simplistic scenarios. One, we're just turning off uh, population. We're turning off, or not turning off population. We're turning off um, dams. We're turning off groundwater extraction. So this, in the red, is a more pristine type situation. In the blue is a, a, a contemporary situation. And the spread of this color are, represents different population growth scenarios. So a high population growth scenario and a low population growth scenario. And we, the first thing that jumps out is population is a major driver, um, in, in many cases far more important than any environmental changes for some of these systems. This is the, the Mekong and the Mississippi on the right. And we can look at across different deltas and start to see how can we balance these different uh, environmental impacts, and what does this mean for the long-term populations at risk in, in all of these different systems, and how does that compare to the uncertainty in, in population estimates? So this is a, a contemporary in the blue, and here is just a higher sea level rise rate. Um, so certain deltas like the Limpopo really pop up between the two. Uh, so we're starting to be able to ask these kind of what-if questions in a very broad sense. There's a lot of uncertainty here. Um, but I think it's very important to note that a lot of the uncertainty is associated with the social questions. So uh, I think one of the major, major conclusions here is that collaborations with our social science uh, colleagues, our economists, and our demographers are, are very, very important when we're uh, incorporating, trying to answer any of these risk questions. Uh, certainly on the same order of importance as the environmental and geophysical change questions. Um, and so we, in terms of the changing risk, we've, we're able to identify many of the deltas that are most sensitive to 
increased sea level rise, relative sea level rise, contemporary, in a contemporary situation, and also identifying some of the challenges that the more wealthy deltas are going to be facing, uh, likely in the near to medium term future. Uh, so, thank you. Oh, and I should say, all of our maps and data sets are available online. Um, so if you would like to either contact me or uh, at this website, we have all of the data that, that went into this that we put together. So uh, global sea level rise is uh, uh, the melting of, of, of the polar ice sheets going to be very non-uniform on a yes. global scale and especially exaggerated on the low latitudes. So it's, is that incorporated? In um, yes, in the... If I go back... Here. This is a, a local sea level rise trend from derived from satellite altimetry. We've computed the, the trends up till now. It there's no forecasting in this, so it doesn't include uh, potential future uh, local and regional differences in sea level rise. But uh, over the past 30 years, that's that's incorporated here. Okay. Thank you. Thanks,